Welcome everyone to our daily devotionals on the book of James here in our 30 day growth challenge. Of course, going along with our daily growth book. And today we're gonna to be looking at James chapter two, verses 14 through 17. Yesterday, Pastor Christy did an amazing job covering the verses just before this passage. But I wanna dive right in to what we're gonna be covering today. Just a little review though. James is the half brother of Jesus, as we've already learned was a late convert from Judaism and likely coming only to saving faith in Jesus after Jesus died and was resurrected. His letter, this book that we're studying, is forthright and direct about how we should live out our faith in a variety of circumstances. We should also keep in mind that he is writing primarily to people just like himself, Jewish believers in Jesus, people who came to believe that Jesus was and is the promised Messiah of the Old Testament. So James, whom Paul identifies as one of the pillars in the New Testament church in Galatians 2.9, is a central figure in the early controversies that arise as more and more Gentiles are welcomed into the Christian faith. James actually ended up overseeing a council in Jerusalem around 4950 AD where the final decision was made about whether Gentile converts would need to be circumcised and uphold other Jewish laws like being kosher and observing certain feast days. Why do I say that? Well, it's important to know that context as we read especially this passage from James because it gives us some important understanding of what he's really trying to say. James is uniquely positioned to speak to this people group about what their lives should look like now that they have embraced faith in Jesus. He has already ruled decisively on the outward trappings of Judaism and agreed wholeheartedly with Paul that the religious burden of observing the Old Testament law should not be placed on new believers. Yet, and there is no disagreement with Paul here, he knows that there still must be some rule of conduct, some guideline by which we live as Christians. And that's kind of the heart of what we're going to jump into right now. This is the challenge that James takes up in chapter 2 of his letter to the 12 tribes, Jewish believers scattered abroad, which he said in James 1.1. And his straightforward communication style is on display again here in our passage. As we learned already in chapter 1, James taught that a saving belief in God changes how a Christian looks at trials in their lives. It affects where they turn for help and who they credit for good. Believers don't just hear the word, they do it in this chapter. James insists that our faith in God should keep us from showing favoritism to the rich and powerful on earth and should provoke us to love our poor neighbors as ourselves. Now let's dive into what he has to say to us today in James 2, 14 through 17. I'm excited about this passage. Verse 14 says, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Now, wait a minute. If you're like me, your first thought may be, how in the world can he say something like that? I thought Paul already established that we are saved only by grace when we believe in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, Paul says this, God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. So how does this statement from Paul stand next to James' statement about faith without works can't save you? Well, let's look at this. If we take only these two verses by themselves, there does very much seem to be a controversy. However, if we look just a little further into what Paul had to say by reading the very next verse in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we get a broader, a much broader understanding and begin to grasp what James is saying much better, right? Ephesians 2.10 says, for, so following the verse that just said, none of us can boast, that's not about the good things that we do. Verse 10 says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. So Paul and James are not contradicting one another. In fact, they are speaking the same language. They both would agree that we are saved by grace through faith, not by works. But they both also agree that the same faith that saves us will be accompanied by good works 
works, by good things. Paul says the same thing in his letter to Titus. So Paul, again, reiterating this truth. In Titus 3, 8, it says this, the same, this saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. So James is saying the same thing here in verse 14. He is making the bold statement for the first time in this chapter that while good works may not be the source of our salvation, they are an expected outcome of our salvation. The fruit of saving faith is good works. He goes on throughout the rest of this chapter to prove this point and to show us what genuine saving faith really looks like. Here's a hint. It's alive. It's living and active. First, let's look at this graphic illustration in our passage today. James 2, 15 through 17 says, Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, Goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. As David Guzik puts it, faith alone saves us, but it must be a living faith. We can tell if faith is alive by seeing if it is accompanied by works. And if it does not have works, it is dead. A living faith is simply a real faith. Now, the world-famous Chuck Smith used the illustration of a bomb threat on a Sunday morning at church service to help us get what that means. In other words, here's the story. I walk in on a Sunday morning to make our announcements, as I often do, and I very calmly tell the audience, Hey, everyone, welcome to The Way. Just wanted you to know there's a bomb in our building now, and we're all going to die in about two minutes. And then proceed to make our announcements. Would anyone believe that I was telling the truth about that bomb? Of course not, because my behavior doesn't, doesn't line up with those words. But if I come in and say, everyone, get out of this place right now. There's a bomb that's about to go off in two minutes, and I run out of the building, people will be inclined to believe me. They'll see by my actions that I believe what I am saying And that is exactly what James is saying. When we really truly believe, our actions are impacted. The way we live, what we do will be evident to the people around us. So real faith should be visible to those around you. Real faith will also cost you something, which I think is a very key point of this verse. Real faith won't allow you to be warm and contented while another human being is suffering beside you. It won't allow you to be satisfied with a simple well-wish or a cliche phrase when you are confronted with a startling, unignorable need. John Trapp, a famous Bible commentator, had harsh words for those who could see a real need and answer it as if it was nothing more than a sneeze by saying, God bless you. The cold reality is that those who can and have done as much are on very shaky footing when it comes to whether their hearts are truly right with God. There ought to be inside of us the very spirit of Christ Jesus himself, whom we have invited into our hearts just last week or last year or 25 years ago or more by believing in him and confessing him as Lord. And James is saying, if you've invited him in, if you've invited Jesus to live in your heart, then if you've truly allowed him to make his home there, you'll be changed You'll never be the same again because you'll begin to see with his eyes and burn with his compassion for the hurting, the lonely, and the lost. If you're like me, this verse brings on not a little bit of conviction. I think of the homeless that surround our church here at the Hallmark campus, of those around our Arrowhead campus, of the men and women who've never seemed to stop needing some money or gas or another meal. How many times have I simply told myself I was too busy to stop or convinced myself that the need wasn't real or important. So what do I do with that conviction? Well, first, I reject the condemnation of the enemy, and he will certainly try to bring condemnation, even when we read a verse like this, that vague sense that no matter how many times I have stopped and helped, it wasn't enough. That vague sense that I can never do enough. That vague sense that I failed and I will always fail. That is condemnation, and it comes from the enemy. We must reject the vague for the specific conviction of the Holy Spirit. 
and I invite him to show me the ones that I am to care for. I may say, God, I missed it this week. I passed by that homeless person. I walked by a brother or sister in need. I didn't fulfill the call that you had placed in my heart, that nudge that I felt I ignored, but don't allow me to do it again. Please, God, give me your eyes to see. Give me your heart to meet those needs around me. I invite the Holy Spirit to help you never miss another opportunity. Invite him to help you walk in the living faith that James is challenging us to walk in today. I wanna pray for you. As you think about the opportunities that might come your way, I pray that the Holy Spirit would give you that same urge, that power to do what he's calling you to do so that you can make sure you're not one of these people that just says God bless you when a real need needs to be met. I love you guys. I'm so glad you listened today. I can't wait for the next part of our study of James. I'm sure you're excited about it too. God bless you and have a great day.